up the story. In 1979, pubs and clubs were brought to a standstill by the voice of a man claiming to be a serial killer called the Yorkshire Ripper. I have the greatest respect for you, George. But Lord, no one will near catching me now. Than four years ago when I started. He'd recorded a sinister message to the police, which they broadcast, hoping someone would recognise the voice and lead them to the notorious murderer. Listening to the tape in Sunderland Catholic Club was a part-time barman called Patrick Lavelle. The 19-year-old had dropped out of school, a punk rocker without a single GCSE. After a series of dead-end jobs, he juggled shifts at the club with studying for some qualifications. The first time I heard the tape, I was working in the concert room, which is normally where you have turns entertainment on. I can't remember what the turn was that night, but uh, it turned out to be the police. The concert room was packed. I think there was about 150 to 200 people in, and uh, they were very attentive. You could actually hear a pin drop. Uh, it, it was, I, I think it might have been on the TV beforehand, the, the voice, but here they had police officers playing it, uh, and people did listen into it, and it was obviously the talk of the club, it was the talk of the town, and the national media spotlight was on Sunderland. Everybody was talking about it. Chris Gregg was the same age as Patrick Lavelle, just 19, when he followed in his father's footsteps and joined the police in West Yorkshire. By 1979, he was a detective on the Yorkshire Ripper Inquiry team. I was actually working as uh, a young detective on the murder of Josephine Whitaker over at Halifax, and it was during that inquiry that the tape was, uh, was received and, uh, by George Oldfield and was played to the, the team who were investigating that, and I was part of that team. The tape and three letters from someone claiming to be the Yorkshire Ripper had a huge impact on the biggest criminal case of the 20th century. The Yorkshire Ripper had killed ten women and attacked seven others. The police had spent five years hunting him and got nowhere. They desperately wanted the letters and tape to be the breakthrough they needed. 247 hoax letters had been received during the Ripper inquiry, but this writer had such detailed information about the murders that the head of the inquiry, West Yorkshire Assistant Chief Constable George Oldfield, was convinced whoever sent them had to be the killer. I'm not quite sure when I'll strike again, but it will be definitely sometime this year, maybe September, October. Even sooner if I get the chance. Voice experts said it was a Castletown accent on the edge of Sunderland. Overnight, the investigation switched from West Yorkshire, where most of the victims had lived, to Sunderland. The police inquiries in Sunderland were exhaustive. Uh, you know, they were interviewing anyone between the ages of, uh, I think it was 22, up to about 50. They, uh, there was, they were going around collecting saliva samples from hundreds of men. Some men had to have their uh, teeth imprints um, you know, a mould made of them, uh, handwriting samples taken, uh, sometimes obviously voice recognition, uh, sometimes voice recording. Uh, it was re a real extensive, well, it was the biggest manhunt at the time in Britain. So if you can imagine the biggest manhunt in Britain in this, what is a relatively small geographical area, it was immense. We're talking about a massive inquiry and everyone in Sunderland knew about it, no doubt about that. At that stage, I, I just didn't think I would ever uh, have any involvement in it, and I, I never realised, or I, I couldn't visualise what impact it would have on my life personally. Among thousands of people interviewed was Ron Fulberg, a Sunderland man working in Bradford as a coalman. He was questioned several times. It was one of my customers, actually, phoned the police and said that I looked like the Ripper and that was when I first started getting arrested for it. I was interviewed 14 times by different police forces, Huddersfield, Halifax, most, most of all Bradford. The actual description that they had for the hoaxer actually fitted me at the time. The gap between the teeth, the broad Geordie accent, a lorry driver. You know, I was a lorry driver. I drove a wagon day in, day out around the areas where the murders were committed and the police just wouldn't give up. One, you know, it was just time after time after time. You know, I moved, I moved twice to get away from it all. 
But even with it, I moved. They moved with it. And the police followed me wherever I went. People knew that I'd been arrested. And I mean, you see, you walk down the street and you see somebody looking and you think, well, what they're saying about is now. You know, it just didn't give up. It went on time after time after time. And I thought it was never, ever going to end. The police were suspicious of someone called S. Smith, who borrowed many crime books from the library. When they went to interview him, S. Smith turned out to be a woman. Well, as I said to the detective, um, you really must be scraping the bottom of the barrel to go into the library service. He said we're just pursuing any line of inquiry, anything to do with crime. We're following it up in any way we can to try and catch this man. He came back the next day and had an interview with Stan, took a handwriting sample, and that was it. We heard no more. I don't think anyone would like to see the same thing happen at their door, to think that the husband that they'd lived with all these years was under suspicion of being a mass murderer. Terrible. Another person in Sunderland was equally interested in books about crime. John Humble was four years older than Patrick Lavelle. He lived in Halstead Square on Hilton Estate with his mother Violet, his much younger sister Jean and brother Henry, who was away in the army. Unemployed and bored after abandoning a building apprenticeship, he walked to Cale Road Library and took out a book about the Victorian Jack the Ripper.